Well, good evening and welcome to another edition of Monday Night Calculus. My name is Curtis Brown and I am so excited to have Steve Kokoska and Tom Dick joining me once again for a fun evening of calculus. Um, Steve, I know you've prepared some great problems and hopefully the folks out there have gotten a chance to uh, give some of those to their students and have them uh, take a little bit of practice with them, and maybe even some students have joined on. So if you are a student this evening joining us either live or watching this uh, afterward, welcome. We're so excited that you are here. Uh, so Steve, I, I know we were talking about this just a moment ago, but today is October 3rd. Do you know anything about the significance of October 3rd? Oddly enough, I didn't. But uh, what <laughs> is so special about this day, Curtis? <laughs> so, so happy Mean Girls Day to everyone oh, out there. This is a, a great, uh, great show. You should go out and go check it out. This is a, a good thing, calculus-wise, good, good show to go uh, see. But anyway... Great day to celebrate uh, math and uh, all things calculus. All right, so I'll see if I can share my screen here and we'll get started. How's that? That looks good. All right, I'm gonna try even to make that just a little bit bigger. Let's see if I can do that. Hey, how about that? And, and I apologize, Curtis, did you say we were giving 25 bonus points to anybody who knows the uh, final limit in that movie? You know or? what? I'll give 25 bonus points to anybody who knows the limit uh, <laughs> at the end okay. of the movie. Wants to put that in the chat, I'd be happy to give them 25 <laughs> bonus points. Okay. This is kind of like that other show where, uh, you know, lots of things are made up and the points, uh, <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> All right. All right, so this year, this academic year, what we've been trying to do is to tie our presentations a little bit more closely to the AP Calculus course and exam description. And so uh, tonight we're going to talk about what I call the derivatives of the other trig functions. And here are the skills and the enduring understanding and the learning objective and the essential knowledge from the CED. So if you're trying to coordinate this with your curriculum, if you're planning, uh, if you're putting together a lesson plan, uh, this might help you a little bit. At least we thought it might. And uh, like I did last time, I'm going to start out by uh, thinking a little bit about some background information, some information that you might need as we go through and look at some of my examples and solve some of these problems. So I'm going to assume, first of all, that you know the derivative of the sine and you know the derivative of the cosine. And just to get you going a little bit, Curtis, I apologize. I'm going to ask you lots of questions tonight. Um, do you remember how we found the derivative of the sine was equal to the cosine? Do you remember how we did that? Uh, I don't. Right oh, right no. Offhand. Anybody out there maybe remember how we did that one? I'm going to scroll. Um, I'll watch the chat here, Steve. I'll see. Okay. What we had to do is actually we had to go back to the definition. And we looked at the definition of the derivative right down here. And we let f of x be equal to the sine of x. And so we took a look at the limit of the sine of x plus h minus the sine of x, all of that divided by h. And then what we ended up doing was expanding the sine of x plus h. We used the uh, sine identity there. And then we, we took a look at two separate limits that are used throughout uh, uh, limits involving trigonometry. It was a very long process. There's also a geometric way to kind of think about this. It was a very long process. So we might use the definition of the derivative here. And I don't mean to imply that you know we only have one that we use. I just want to remind you of the alternate one here. I'm going to do some more scribbling. The limit as x goes to a of f of x minus f of a divided by x minus a. And one of the reasons that I'm writing that over there is because it seems to me that on the multiple choice portion of the exam, there's frequently a limit given like this using the alternate form. And students are asked to identify the value of the limit. And what they need to do to get the answer is to recognize that it's actually the definition of the derivative of a function of a function evaluated at a specific value a. And we might use some differentiation rules tonight. For example, we might use the derivative of a sum 
oh, the derivative of a difference, I'll abbreviate there. We might use the derivative of a product. So you got to remember those. We might, uh, that one, you might, we might use the definition or the rule for the derivative of a quotient. And somewhere along the line, we might also use the chain rule. So, okay, a little bit of background. Let's see what we can do with these other trig functions. I kind of like this section, I like this material. Let's start out with this one and see what we can do. Let's see if we can find the derivative of the tangent. Well, one way to do this and a common way to find some derivatives of trig functions uh, other than those involving sine and cosine is to get everything back in terms of sine and cosine. Because I know the derivatives of those two functions. So I'm going to rewrite tangent by its definition as sine of a cosine. And now I'm going to try to use the quotient rule here. Don't let me make a mistake on this one, Curtis. So here we go. Quotient rule. Bring the denominator up. Cosine. Derivative of the numerator minus the numerator times the derivative of the denominator. All of that divided by the denominator squared. Okay, so let's see. We know the derivative of the sine is the cosine. Uh, we know the derivative of the cosine is minus the sine. So that's good. I see two minus signs here. So in the numerator, I end up with a cosine squared plus sine squared. We know that trig identity. We know that's equal to one. So I've got a one over the cosine squared. And by the definition of the secant function, the derivative of the tangent is the secant squared. And that's pretty cool. And that now opens up all sorts of other derivative problems involving tangent. So before I try another problem, I think we're going to bring a little technology in here early. Tom, is that OK? Yeah, that'd be great. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to pass it over to you and the TI-84 and the TI-Inspire. Okay. All right, let's see if I can uh, make this transition without too much problem. And I'm going to share my screen and hopefully you all are seeing a TI-84 Y equals screen. That looks okay. Indeed. Got it. All right. Um, so one thing I did want to touch on, uh, Steve, you mentioned back in the review of finding the derivative of sine x, uh, kind of how we derive that rigorously and then yes. you know, ways to look at it geometrically. Yep. Uh, and I thought I would just take a little bit of time to, to show a technique that actually, the first time I saw it, I was just surprised how effective it was for kind of visualizing graphically uh, what was going on. So what I'm going to do here is just go ahead and graph sine x. And I'll just uh, do this in a, I tend to use a zoom decimal window because the, uh, the values are fairly nice. And there's a nice graph of y equals sine x that we're used to. And what I'm going to do is uh, go back to the y equals menu. And I'm going to use the definition of the derivative in a way. Uh, and, the, and the way I'm going to do this is uh, you had the, the general definition was uh, the limit as h approaches zero, or one of them, you had two, two versions of it. One yeah. of them, the one I think students are more used to is that f of x plus h mm -hmm. minus f of x, that quantity all over h, and then looking at that limit as h approaches zero. But what I'm going to do is actually take that uh, quotient and just put in a value for h. Okay. Okay. Now I could do this in terms of sine, but to make this more general, I'm going to go ahead and uh, make y2 in terms of y1. So I'm going to go okay. uh, gotcha. to my y variables and I'm going to take a y1 of x plus, uh, and this is not a particularly small h, but 0 0.1. Okay. And I've already realized I should have uh, put in a leading parenthesis. So let me uh, go ahead and insert that. There we go. So we've got y1 of x plus 0 0.1. Gotcha. And I'm going to subtract um, y1 of x. Okay.
So that's our um, numerator, very general. That's our numerator. Point. Yeah, with h equal to point uh, one. Gotcha. And so I'm going to divide all of that by zero point one. Okay. But what I want to do is just graph that function along with sine x and just see what they look like. Okay. So this is basically an a, a I call it a difference quotient function with the h equal to 0.1. Okay. All right, so let's look at a graph. And this red graph is that difference quotient function. That's and pretty amazing, isn't it? Man, I, I take a look at that and gosh, I, I'm tempted that I think I recognize this graph. <laughs> <laughs> it looks, looks a heck of a lot like the cosine. Uh, but, you know, and just in general, without thinking about identifying it, is just looking at the relationship between the two graphs. Here at x equals zero, my sign looks like it has about a slope of one. Mm -hmm. And that's the value of the derivative function there. Yep. And where there's a maximum on my original function and it's flat, slope zero, that's going to be a zero of my Derivative, and this isn't a true derivative, it's really just an approximation, but it's incredibly close. In fact, I think uh, students, if they're familiar enough with their trig functions, a lot of them would guess, say, wow, that sure looks like cosine. And in fact, just for fun, let's go ahead back to the y equals. Tom, you're getting quite a few folks here commenting that that's pretty cool. They hadn't seen that before, or at least they, you know, they find that visualization really cool. And I agree. It's so cool. You can tie those two together and kind of see the derivative and the, you know, how it relates to the actual uh, function graph the sine curve pretty yeah. nicely there. Well done. What's, what's so surprising to me, guys, is that this works so well. I don't consider that a very small H. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I, I, oh, I would think your H has to be, H. when I think H approaches zero, I'm thinking really close to zero. And, and, Point one doesn't seem that close to me. So it's really surprising. Well, and it's not that close to zero on the scale of your range values. You, I mean, you, you're not dealing yeah. with big values. Point one is big. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I'm going to put in a cosine X uh, and go ahead and now graph that. See, is it really big? And you can see just a slight difference. There's a little bit of a... Mm -hmm. um, I mean, if that was perfect, you wouldn't even, even see the red graph anymore because it'd be right on top of it. But, so we can see it's not exactly uh, equal to drib, but it just really, really close. So that was kind of cool. So uh, I was going to go ahead and take uh, another look uh, at, let's see, let me go ahead and clear out Y3. But uh, see, Steve looked at the tangent function. Let's do the same thing with it. Okay, notice that I don't have to redefine my y2 because I did it in terms of y1. Mm -hmm. So let's uh, do tangent of x. And so we're going to graph both of these. So the blue graph that you see when we when I hit graph will be that of tangent x. And then following that, we'll see this difference quotient function. All right. There we see several branches of the tangent. And again, without even trying to identify the function, um, just looking graphically, this is making sense. When I look at my tangent function, it is always increasing. So that means I should expect the derivative function to always be positive. And it looks like the smallest slope is actually right where the tangent graph crosses the x-axis. And the slope there is about one. And that's the low point. That's the smallest slope on each of these branches of my derivative. And that's a really, uh, let's see, I think you ended up with secant squared as, yes, your, right? as your derivative. So we could you know, go back and see just how good a job we did here, let's see, um, secant squared. Let's see, I think we might want to do one divided by the cosine squared. Okay.
And let's see, I think I've got that in there. Let's take a look, see how good a job that difference quotient did. I'll hit graph. Wow, it's just really, again, there's, you, you can see there really is a little bit of a difference, but yep. it's amazing that difference quotient. Uh, and by the way, the thing is, I realize this is kind of uh, our, uh, our students now, um, they were born after graphing calculators came out. <laughs> you and I, we're, we're old enough. We remember when folks didn't have graphing calculators. Graphing something like that difference quotient function is not anything you would have dreamt of doing by hand. Not possible. You, you will, you would be using some kind of calculator anyway, just to figure out individual values. But it's, it's, uh, it's really inviting to do that. And I do this all the time now. Just It's kind of a reality check. Say, so, okay, is my intuition mm -hmm. about what the derivative should look like really making sense? Okay. So, Tom, I have another question about this graph, sure. if you could do this real easy. Okay. So once you graph the tangent and once you graph that difference quotient in red, uh, one might look at that uh, red graph. And we're going to guess at what the derivative of the tangent is. We haven't done anything analytical mm -hmm. yet. So we might guess at that and say, well, you know, your students are going to look at that and say, well, you know, it does look like the secant function. Right. So if you graph that, uh, will we be able to see the difference there? Oh, okay. So you're thinking, uh, let's add a, another graph. Of just well, you don't need to add secant. another one. Uh, go to Y3 and just get rid of that squared on Y3. Okay. And let's just see how close that is. And would it be far enough away? Or would it be distinct enough that we would say, oh, you know, we, we would get that if we square terms? All right, let's take a look. Yeah. So here's our tangent again. Tangent. Okay. And I probably should have turned off the... Uh, ah, how about that? Yeah, okay, now we okay. see. So you certainly see it in a couple of places where the graph of the secant is below the x-axis. So that might be a tip off, right? That you're squaring mm -hmm. things. Although one- And thing. plus it's increasing um, the squaring we can see where uh, the secant, uh, uh, these branches of it aren't parabolas, but they kind of are parabola-like. Yes, uh, yes. And we can see it, it's, it's squished. A bit from the regular yeah. Secret, yeah. Secret, which might suggest to someone, well, maybe it's a higher power. Yeah. Yep. And like you said, the even power, the squaring, takes care of flipping those negative ones up to the, uh, which it does have to be, just looking at the tangent graph, we're going to have to have a function that's always positive. So, makes sense. Yeah. Good. Thank okay. you. So, very cool. Okay. All right. I'm going to stop the share and turn it back over to you. Okay. Sounds good. All right, let's try another one. We've just did a lot of talk about the secant of X. Let's see if we can find the derivative of the secant of X. And again, what I'm gonna to try to do is to get this back to something I know about, problem solving skill, bring it back to something familiar. So I'm gonna write secant in terms of cosine. And I just wanna circle something here if I can. Notice the way that I wrote this, cosine of X to the minus one as opposed to something like this, cosine minus one of x. So this might be uh, mistaken for the arc cosine. So just to make sure that this is understandable, this is a function raised to the minus one power. Well, how do you take the derivative of that? We know how to do that. We can use the power rule and the chain rule. We bring the minus one down, leave the argument alone, Subtract one from the exponent. So minus one cosine of X to the minus two, derivative of the inner function. Well, there's one of the background derivatives, minus sine of X. And now I'm gonna group things in a judicious way here. I've got two cosines in the denominator. My minus signs are gonna cancel. So I've got one over the cosine times a sine over the cosine. And that's our familiar secant times tangent. So that's pretty cool. Now, I'm not gonna go through all of these, but I am gonna ask a couple of questions here. Here's a derivative table now, a derivative table of all of our trig functions. Well, we already knew the derivative of the sine and the derivative of the cosine. 
We just found the derivative of the tangent. We just found the derivative of the secant. And given what we've done here in a couple of problems, a couple of examples, oh, sorry, Curtis, I'm gonna to have to ask you this one. How do you think we would find, show what the derivative of the cosecant is? Well, we do that one. Seems like I'm gonna walk right into this one. Seems like we could do a little bit of what we have just done, right? Okay. So we could write that as the sine of x raised to the minus one and take right. the derivative of that. Perfect, beautiful. And how are we gonna find, how are you gonna have your students find the derivative of the cotangent? I'm gonna give you one way and then I'm gonna look for another way, okay? So one way is of course, we could write the cotangent as the cosine of x over the sine of x. And then we could take the derivative of that using the quotient rule. But you know what? There might even be a sneakier way to do that. Can you think of one, Curtis? I don't mean to imply that you're a sneaky guy, but I, I thought you might have a, a way to do this. <laughs> <laughs> um, Any idea? I don't know. Anybody in the chat room or is there still that long delay? Quo quotient rule maybe? Well, here we're gonna use the quotient rule for sure. But I wonder if there's another way that we could find this, especially in light of the fact that now we've got five out of the six derivatives of trig functions. Well, could we apply some of the stuff we already know? Yes, yes. Um, Very general statement, however. Oh, well, I'm trying to be as general as I can. <laughs> uh, Anybody in the chat room? If I've got... Uh, What's another way to write cotangent? Of... What's another way to write cotangent, but not with sines and cosines? One over co one over tan x. Ah, thank so you, Don. I wrote that as the tangent of x raised to the minus one power. Now hey, I can Wanda. do the power rule and the chain rule again. Beautiful, very good, excellent. Okay, well that's a lot of fun for me. I enjoy that. Let's see if we can apply some of these ideas to a couple of problems. Um, these are the problems that we posted on uh, on the website for tonight. So here we go. Let's see if I can find an equation of the line tangent to the graph of f, which is just plain secant of x at x equal pi over four. Um, I just wanna remark or as an aside here, you know, we still see problems like this in the multiple choice portion of the exam. Uh, on, a, uh, on the portion of the exam, we are not allowed to use a calculator. And you have to know some of these values of your trig functions and you have to put them all together here to come up with an equation of the tangent line. Well, okay, I know that in order to do this, I need a point and a slope, so I'm gonna work towards my point first. So I've gotta find f of pi over four is the square root of two. Where the heck did that come from? Well, let's see, that's the secant really, right? Of pi over four, um, which is what? By definition, one over the cosine of pi over four. I'm doing this in a long-winded way. This is the way I learned it, I think. And let's see, what's the cosine of pi over four? Well, one way to get right that is one over the square root of two. And there's my square root of two. So now I've got a point. I've got this point pi over four, square root of two. Now I've got to find the slope and we do that by finding the derivative, okay? We know that if f of x is the secant of x, we know what the derivative is, we found that. So we have to evaluate the derivative at pi over four. Let's see, did I do that right? Secant of pi over four, we know is the square root of two. We just did that up above. And let's see, the tangent of pi over four, yep, sine over cosine, yep, that's one. So son of a gun, the slope of the tangent line there is the square root of two. So an equation of the tangent line, let's see, y minus y one, y minus the square root of two is equal to m, the slope, square root of two times x minus x1, x minus pi over four. Uh, on the free response portion of the exam, if you had to come up with this equation, you can certainly leave it like that. If you prefer to simplify just a little bit, it would look like this, that is an equation of the tangent line, uh, but be careful when you simplify. If you make a mistaken simplification on the free response portion of the exam, you would lose a point but I think that's the right answer. I'm gonna scribble a little bit more off to the side. I think we've talked about this before, Curtis, but just for emphasis, we're looking for an equation of the tangent line. So the question is, is this an equation to the tangent line? 
y minus the square root of two over x minus pi over four, which is equal to the square root of two. Can I write something like that? Is that a valid equation for the tangent line? I mean, it sure looks like this one over here. It sure looks like all I did was divide both sides by the same expression, x minus pi over four, but can I present that as the equation of the tangent line? Anything in the chat room on that one? I'll watch, Steve. I haven't seen anything yet. All right, while they're thinking about that one, you know that I like to check things using a graph, Curtis, and so I drew a graph of my original function secant of x, and I drew in a graph of my tangent line up here just to make sure that everything made sense. So let me add in just a little bit down below here. This is the point pi over four, square root of two. Does that make sense? Yeah, I see pi over four, halfway between here, zero pi over two, square root of two, 1.4. Yeah, that looks about right. I've drawn in my tangent line, and yes, it certainly looks reasonable. Uh, it looks like it is tangent to the curve pointing in the right direction. Did you get an answer? You have a comment uh, that x cannot be pi over four. Um, correct. I guess that makes sense. I wasn't even, I didn't read your response there, Steve. I should have read it a little closer, but yeah, x can't be pi over four. That is correct. So the domain over here on the right-hand side on that expression is different. That is not an equation of the tangent line because x cannot equal pi over four. So that will not receive credit for an equation of the tangent line. Fantastic, I like that problem. Uh, again, I think you'd see something like that with some symbolic answers in there, some analytical answers in there, not a calculator active question. Tom, did you want to do anything with technology on this one? I'm sorry, I apologize. Uh, sure, yeah, I could uh, go ahead and do that. I, I know, um, I'll go ahead and share my screen again. Okay, here we go. All right. And let's see, are you all seeing my uh, 84 yep. screen again? Looks okay. Good, Looks good. Uh, I think the last function uh, had in there for Y3, we were looking at uh, secant and uh, there it is still there. So that was the function you were looking at. Yep. Uh, I know you treated this one like a calculator, uh, not active question. Correct. Uh, but in terms of if, even if we were doing that and we wanted to uh, kind of verify our answer uh, using a calculator, we could go at that. So what I'm going to do is kind of quickly build that derivative or excuse me, that uh, tangent line equation uh, okay. using my calculator. So I've got y3 as my function. Okay. So I'm going to uh, just go back to the calculator screen. I'm not sure what that was left over from something else. And let's see, I'm going to uh, go to my math menu, pull up a uh, derivative and take the derivative with respect to x. And I believe my function was in y3. So yes. Mm -hmm. Let me pull that out very quickly. And so we'll just scroll down there and pick that up. And it was at the uh, pi over four, I believe. Yes, right? correct. And so let me find my uh, pi key. I think I found it. There we go, pi divided by four. And we'll enter that and we get a numerical value that I'm gonna go ahead and store that as uh, m, okay. and we can also do a reality check. You came up with square root of two, and sure it looks like it. square root of two in decimal form enough time. That's going to look pretty familiar and be reassuring. Okay, so there's our slope, uh, and so our value um, of our function at pi over four. Let's go ahead and pull that out. See, that was y3. So I'm going to evaluate y3 at pi over four. Oops, that's not pi. Sorry, I got off one. There we go. Pi divided by four. Beautiful. Aha. Uh -huh. That's correct. All right, it's square root of two. So both the slope. And that value were pi over two, or Correct. excuse me, square root of two, rather, not pi over two. Okay, so reassuring again. 
And so now we can uh, build our uh, equation. Uh, let's see, let me store this. Uh, I'm gonna store it as the, uh, uh, let me just use uh, B for this. And let's see, I'm gonna go back to uh, my Y equals menu. I'll put this in Y1. Let's see, uh, we're gonna have uh, the slope. So that was alpha M. We're gonna multiply that times X minus pi over four. Okay, looks good, looks good. And then um, it was a Y minus that B value. So I'm gonna to have to add that B value over here. So I am doing a little bit of algebra in there. So just reality check when X is pi over four, I should get B and the slope is M. This should give me our tangent line. And so now when I hit graph, I should see the graph of secant and the graph of this line. And let's see how we did here. Boom, looks pretty nice. Pretty okay. cool. Yeah. And if we did a trace, um, let's see, we could actually put in, I, th I think we could put in pi over four for X. Mm -hmm. Let's see what happens if we do that. Cross my fingers, this works. <laughs> there it is, right at that tangent. Okay. okay. So again, I, it, this was not really intended as a calculator active uh, question, uh, but uh, I often find myself using the calculator to uh, verify my symbolic work. And this is a way we could do it here. So I will stop the share and turn it back over to you. Okay, thank you. Here we go, let's try another one. Okay, let's try a couple. I like these two. Let's try these two. Um, Tom, you may remember uh, this summer um, talking about problem solving and the lost art of problem solving. And I was talking about that issue again with a friend of mine over the weekend. And I said to him, and he's a real good problem solver in general. I said, how'd you become a real good problem solver? He said, you know, he went to Catholic school. He said, I remember sister so-and-so giving me 50 problems a night to do. And I developed this toolbox of functions and problems. And I had this toolbox to go back to. And that's kind of what I see in a couple of these problems here that we're going to do. Let's see if we can find the derivative of each function. Well, let's look at part A. Let's look at A here. This is a tough one. It's got a cosecant in there. It's got a cotangent in there. And son of a gun, this is a quotient. So we're going to have to use the quotient rule. And, and Curtis, don't let me make a mistake on this one. Here we go. There's lots of tricks. I'll do what I can. I don't know. Lots of trig functions floating around here. Let's see. Uh, bring the denominator up. There it is. One plus the cotangent, derivative of the numerator, minus the numerator times the derivative of the denominator. OK. One plus the cotangent of x squared. OK. I'm trying to be very careful, too, with my notation. All right, let's see, derivative of the cosecant, that was minus cosecant cotangent. We learned that, we had that in our table. And let's see, what's the derivative over here? Well, the derivative of one is easy, that's zero. Derivative of the cotangent minus cosecant squared, yikes. Okay, I'm not gonna do anything in that denominator yet. And let's see, if I simplify a little, did I do this right? I'm gonna factor out from everything a minus cosecant of x, so let's see. If I take out a minus cosecant of x, there's a cotangent. And then there's a cotangent squared. Okay, I got that. And let's see, I took a minus out and I took one cosecant out. Okay, so I've got a cosecant squared on the end. Yikes, okay. So now I'm gonna use a trig identity. And I know that the cotangent squared is cosecant squared minus one. Son of a gun, I've got a little bit of cancellation here. And then I think when I'm all done with this, I've got a cosecant of x times one minus the cotangent, and I'm not gonna do anything with that denominator. Yikes. How about that? Great multiple choice question on the exam. Uh, I think you might, you might see something like this. 
Now, I have an alternate approach to this problem, and I, I need someone to help me reconcile this. I'm not sure what's going on here. Well, okay, I have an idea, but I need a little help on this one. So let me see if I did this right. What I'm gonna try to do here is to apply a technique that I did a little while ago with tangent. And that is I'm gonna get everything back into sines and cosines. So let's see, did I do this right? Cosecant one divided by the sine, cotangent cosine over sine, common denominator in the numerator, and let's see, the signs cancel. And I think I can write this expression as sine of x plus the cosine of x. All of that raised to the minus one. Well, this fits in very nicely with some of the problems, some of the examples that we've actually already looked at this evening. How do you find the derivative of that function? Well, that's the power rule and then the chain rule. So let's see, minus one, sine of x plus cosine of x argument to the minus two derivative of the inner function. Derivative of the sine is cosine, derivative of the cosine minus the sine, there it is. And okay, not much simplification, but there it is. So Curtis, here's my dilemma. These two answers don't look very much alike at all. So what's going on here? How do I reconcile this? It almost looks like I've taken the derivative correctly in two different ways. And it almost looks like I've got two different answers. Well, I think I you think probably that... use a couple of trig identities uh, to help you kind of reconcile that. But before, before we do, Steve, I, I had we had some comments come in earlier, and I know this may be breaking the rules. It's okay. Bit, but uh, there were some comments earlier about uh, working with some of these derivative rules like this um, prior to uh, chain rule and power rule. Is there any way that we get into, I mean, it seems like I would almost have to do this the way that you did your first, you know, that first one, uh, because I, I wouldn't have in my toolbox power rule and chain rule, um, right? Does I, that I agree with that. that. Sense? Okay. Yeah, I agree with that. I think if you if your students did not have the power rule, chain rule, quotient rule yet, if you're actually doing derivatives of trig functions way before that, uh, I'm not sure how you can get all of this stuff analytically, but you could certainly try to discover some of those basic six derivatives yeah. uh, by using technology, usually the numerical approach that Tom has mentioned. Yeah. Um, that's certainly one way to do it. Uh, another way uh, that it can be done, uh, it takes a little bit longer, but it but it's a nice project to work on in groups. I, I believe I've seen this done, um, is actually do this with a table. And so, for example, if I wanted to try to discover what the derivative of the sine is, I'm going to draw, I'll get a graph of the sine of x, and, and I'm just going to take out my ruler or draw it on graph paper or draw it with grid lines on my calculator. And I'm going to make a table of some slopes. Yeah. And I'm going to yeah, graph those sure. and I'm going to put it together. That's another way to do it. It's a little cruder way to do it. Uh, but it also, I think, stresses some other important concepts, some other good techniques. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. I don't see well, how you could do that. Perhaps this. I could uh, jump in here and please, Tom. Um, maybe clarify. I think what some of the folks are talking about is. Um, if you write secant x, for example, as cosine x to the negative one power, right? Uh, then you're going to end up using a uh, power rule, which is essentially chain rule. But you could, uh, I think some people are commenting they do these things before chain rule. Right. So you would have product rule and quotient rule. And so if you wrote, you know, cos oh, I see. Uh, if you wrote secant it as one, one over cosine, you could just use a quotient rule on it. So yep. it kind of depends on what tools you have available. You could do these a bit earlier than chain rule. Chain rule oh, yeah. is available to exactly. you, then you have another alternative. Gotcha. So, yeah. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. So back to your question. <laughs> yeah. How do you reconcile this? <laughs> so I, I mean, I, I'm I'm really drawing on uh, that I would I would want to use some trig identities to try to get myself back in where I needed to go. I think so too. I think over here we could use some trig identities. And if we worked at it long enough, and it's not that hard, I think we could show that that is indeed 
equal to that. Remember all those problems in your trick glass, given one form of a, an expression, show that it's equal to the other one. Sure, I think we could do that. And I don't think we're gonna do this. We're not gonna spend the time to do this, but another thing one could do is to graph both this expression and this function separately in y1 and y2. And I think you'd see something that Tom was talking about a minute ago. Uh, one would be exactly on top of the other. So you'd only see one of the graphs and that would be some good justification that you know what, they are indeed the same. I also got another uh, suggestion, just divide the top and bottom by sine x. Oh yeah, beautiful, I like that. Very good. Yep. Yeah, down here. Yeah, I like that, very good. Okay, let's try another one. Excellent. I like this one because this involves what I would call the generalized product rule. And so what we really have here is a product of three functions. And I wanna find the derivative of that expression. And so I use this generalized product rule by taking the derivative of each separately and multiplying by the remaining two and then joining it all together through addition. So the derivative of the first times the other two derivative of the second one times the other two, derivative of the third one times the other two. And let's see if I did this right. Derivative of x is one, derivative of the secant, secant tangent, derivative of the tangent, secant squared. And I don't see much simplification here, and I really don't want to simplify that very much. There's g prime of x. But just to check this, what I did is I produced a graph of my original function, and I apologize, that says f right there, but it's really g, and this is really g prime of x. So the blue curve is my original function g, and the green curve is this expression right here. And, you know, does it make sense? Can I explain this graph? Well, maybe if I just take a look at one piece of this, maybe to the left of minus pi over 2. Well, let's see, this is my original function, and it's always increasing. So that means its derivative must always be positive, and indeed it is. And let's see, let's see, where it crosses zero here, let's see, what's its slope right about there, as Tom was saying? Well, that's where its slope is about its smallest, okay, and that's where this function is about its lowest. Okay, I'm feeling pretty good about that. It's looking pretty good. And I think I could make a similar explanation in the other three parts here that I've shown. So that's looking pretty good. I don't know, there's an interesting question here that we might uh, think about here in the chat room too. Uh, I'm gonna try something a little sneaky here, Curtis. I'm gonna come off to the side and if I can, I'm gonna use my eraser just for a minute. And then I'm gonna come back over here. You know, it seems like, it seems like with these tick marks that at minus pi is where this lowest point ought to be. But it doesn't look that way. It looks like it's maybe a little bit over here. So does that seem right? Is that where the, the curve, the original curve, has its smallest slope? Hmm. Seems like it ought to be at minus pi, but it isn't. And remember what that original function was. I'm gonna scribble off to the side here. That was x secant of x tangent of x. We'll just leave that as an open question. I like that one. That's a good one. That is a nice question. You could reflect it across and uh, ask the same question on-, on Over here. Uh, yeah, exactly. Side. Yep. Mm -hmm. So, I, I mean, maybe we should ask something like, well, uh, what is that point? What is that X value where its slope is the smallest? Hey, that's yeah. a good question. That is a good question. 20 bonus points for that one. 20? 20, yeah, that's oh not, as gosh, valuable as getting, the, uh... not as valuable as the Mean Girls thing. All no, right, we, had, we have had at least one successful response. <laughs> we have, okay. And a follow-up bonus question to it oh, in no. the chat as well. Okay. All right. Well, let's try a limit problem. We know a little bit about derivatives of trig functions, all of the trig functions now. Let's try a limit as x goes to zero of the tangent of 5x over the sine of 2x. 
And remember when we uh, do uh, apply L'Hopital's rule here in AP Calculus, remember we can't write anything like this. We cannot write equals zero over zero. That's a no-no for right now with this chief reader. So I'm gonna take a look at those two functions, the numerator and the denominator separately. I can see that the limit as X goes to zero of each of them is indeed zero. I'm just going to scribble a little bit off to the side and we'll leave this as a question for the chat room. How do I know that? I mean, I did that really quickly. I'm not trying to sneak anything by anybody, but how do I know very quickly that the limit of both of those functions is zero? Well, since this is zero over zero, it is in an indeterminate form of zero over zero. So I can apply L'Hopital's rule. And so let's see, I've got the limit as X goes to zero. I take the derivative of the numerator. Well, let's see, derivative of the outer function is secant squared. Let's see, I think I need a five in there, don't I? That's a little bit better. Secant squared of five X and the derivative of the inner function is five. Derivative of the sine of two X is cosine of two X. Derivative of the inner function is two. And now I'm ready to evaluate. And son of a gun, I think as X goes to zero, I think- One of God's your uh, Y, by the way. Pardon me? Oh, good. Give me an answer to that one. Cosan, uh, cosecant and cotangent uh, are not defined at pi. I think uh, that's about the- Oh, is that back in the previous problem? Yeah, back in your previous problem. Uh, well, we had a secant and a tangent in there. And so I think both of those were defined at pi and we had an X out front. So how do we know where that minimum slope is? I'm not sure if that's the answer yet. Anyway, go back to this one. <laughs> I think I've got a limit as X goes to zero finally of five halves. And I had a question to myself, Curtis, on my sheet over here. I don't know if Mark Corrali is listening, but you know he always has a sneaky way to solve these kind of limit problems when there's an integer times x as an argument of one of those trig functions. And maybe there's another sneaky way to solve this one. I'm not sure. But if he's listening, he might have one, OK? <laughs> we'll watch and see. OK. All right, I've got one more question and then we've got a great bonus question that Tom is gonna to help us out with. Let's find the derivative of each function and each of these is pretty quick, pretty straightforward uh, using the chain rule, uh, but I like these, these are good practice questions. How do you take the derivative of this first one? Well, the outermost function is the tangent. So I take the derivative of the tangent, that's the secant squared, leave the argument alone. Derivative of the inner function is the cosine, and I don't see much simplification there. That's fine. How about this one? I remember my college calculus professor used to love to give us questions like these. Start at the outside and work your way in. What's the outermost function? Sometimes my students have a difficult time identifying what that is. Here it's actually a power. It's actually the cosine of that stuff cubed. So it's three times the cosine squared, leave the argument alone. I've taken care of that power, work your way inside. Derivative of the cosine is minus the sine, leave the argument alone. I've taken care of the cosine. Derivative of the tangent, secant squared, leave the argument alone. Derivative of the argument is three. And I did just a little bit of simplification down below. I hope you, some of the teachers out there had the opportunity to give some of these problems to their students. I think these are, are nice warm up problems for tomorrow if you've got this far. And here's one more. Here's a nice problem that we can sort of end on. I know Tom will have a little bit. I'm gonna try to lead you into this, Tom. I'm gonna do my best. This is a bonus question and it says, if f of x is equal to the cosine of x to the two thirds, is x differentiable at x equals zero and y or y not? Well, let's see, I see that x to the two thirds in there and I'm a little worried about that because if I think about what that graph looks like without any trig in there, just y equal x to the two thirds, I'm thinking about that graph and I'm thinking that it has sort of this sharp corner in there, an edge. And I'm thinking, geez, I know that's not differentiable there. 
So how can this possibly be differentiable at x equals zero? Well, let's see what happens, okay? Here's how I might proceed. Here's how some of my students, and I'll play the devil's advocate on this, Tom, if I can. So I'm gonna try to take the derivative of this function f. I'm gonna start at the outermost function, it's cosine. So I'm gonna take the derivative of that, so it's the sine. And there's my x to the two, whoops, that's a two thirds right there. And then I've got to multiply by the derivative of the inner function. Well, let's see, the inner function is this. So here's the power rule, two thirds x, let's see, derivative, I got to subtract one, so that's minus one third. Now I'm gonna simplify this just a little bit for my own benefit so that I can try to answer this question. So don't let me make a mistake on this one, Curtis. I'm gonna to try to write it as a quotient. I think up here in the numerator, I've got a minus sign of x to the two thirds. Oh, and there's a two in there. So there's the minus two. And in the denominator, I think I'm gonna have a three and I'm gonna write that as x to the one third. Did I get everything in there? I think so. Minus two sine of x to the two thirds divided by three x to the one third. Okay, well, Curtis, play along with me. If I wanna know whether or not this function is differentiable at x equals zero, what do you think we ought to do at this point? If it's what? We want to know if this is differentiable at x equals zero. So what do you think we ought to do with this function f prime to answer this question? What do you think we ought to try? If I want to know if f is differentiable at this point, I just found f prime. Well, what seems like a very reasonable thing to do here? Seems like we ought to find the value. Uh, I agree of the derivative, yeah. It seems like we ought to find what's f prime of zero and what's the yeah. problem here. Well, we can't let x equal zero. In the numerator, we can, but in the denominator, we would get the cube root of zero, which is zero. So we get a zero down here in the denominator. So just kind of thinking out loud about this problem, I might, with a very initial knee-jerk reaction, say, you know what? This function is not differentiable at x equals zero. But there's a very important concept here about finding the derivative here analytically. And I hope, Tom, does that lead into what you're going to show us? Uh, sure does, Steve. Yeah. OK. Uh, All right. Here we go. Well, it's, it's really the kind of the fine print on the chain rule. It is indeed, isn't it? Huh? Uh, the chain rule says if you carry out that calculation you just did and you get something that's defined, it's right. But if it's not defined, all bets are off. Yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that your original function is <laughs> not differentiable. Yeah. And in fact, uh, this is, I'm not going to give an analytic proof, which isn't too bad. You can't use L'Hopital's rule be, for the same reason. You, uh, but you go back to the definition of derivative. Yes. And you can slug it out and actually find that it is uh, differentiable. But I'm going to provide some graphical uh, okay. support for this. Uh, I graph that function, cosine okay. x to the two thirds. And what's kind of interesting at the graph at this scale, it actually looks like there might be a sharp corner. It does indeed, doesn't it? Huh? it it's really strange. But yeah. uh, one nice thing we can do with differentiability is just zoom in on the graph. Yes. So that's what I'm going to do here is bring up uh, zoom. And let's zoom in. And I want to zoom in at that uh, at x where x equals zero. And I'm just going to continue zooming in. And even after three zooms, I'm thinking, well, it looks like it may be changing directions pretty fast. You still see that kind of sharp edge in a couple of zooms, don't you? Yeah, it does. It looks it like a sharp, sharp. edge. Yeah. But the more yeah. I zoom in, the flatter it looks. How about that? And in fact, the derivative of this function at zero is zero. It wow. actually is flat there. But the chain rule um, doesn't apply in the usual sense because we didn't get a result out of it. If you get a result out of it, it's the right thing. That, that's what chain rule says is this will when that thing at f prime of g of x times g prime of x, you know, the derivative of the outside function 
the value weight at the inner times the derivative of the inner. If that value exists, it's the right one. But if it's not, we've got to take pause and keep thinking. And try something else. Yeah. So Tom, I have a question about this. If you can possibly do this on a graph screen, uh, pardon me, on a calculator screen, a home screen. Okay. I think I know the answer to this, but I, I, I'd like to, like to see this. What happens on a, on a calculator screen if you simply numerically try to, or you're, in a, you're using an Inspire right now, right? Yeah, but I could do a numerical derivative. Okay, so is. how about if you take a numerical derivative of that function, was it F1? Mm-hmm. And evaluated at zero. Oh, good, good so point. What would happen? Would it, give you, would it give you the answer zero? Yeah, let's try it out and see what happens. Now the derivative at a point. Yeah, okay. Our variable is x. Um, the value is zero that yes. we're interested in. Yep, please. Whoops, excuse me. Let me get zero in there. Uh, well, sorry, I'm fumbling around a little bit here. A lot. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's see. All right. Okay. There you go. On. Gosh, I lost <laughs> my X. Okay, go down. There, go. there we go. Fine. Apologies for the fumbling here. Well, I don't want to cancel. All right. Okay. And we're going to just put in F1 of X. That was yes. our uh, yeah. X to the two thirds, or cosine of X to the two thirds. Ah, interesting. Ah, how about that? So the so, numerical derivative, it's, it was running into uh, some issues there. Okay, so try uh, this. Uh, this, I think it was trying to do it uh, perhaps symbolically. So I, I didn't do the numerical derivative. Let's pull that out. And let's see. We've got a numerical derivative down here. So while you're doing that, Tom, just by putting in, if I put in a decimal point and said x equals zero point, that doesn't change automatically and do that as a numerical derivative, does it? I don't think so. I don't okay. think so. But okay. uh, let me uh, just try to do this. Where x equals zero, and we'll see what happens here. Okay. Zero. How about that? Uh -huh. So I think with the symbolic derivative, it was actually trying to use the chain rule. Yeah. It was coming up with this result that was not defined. But when we actually did the um, numerical derivative, which is basically that difference quotient strategy we were using before, but with a very, very small h, it comes up with an approximation of zero. So would, this, would that numerical derivative, Tom, by any chance be using the symmetric quote difference? Yeah, it quotient? is, and that's why it, you yeah. noticed I actually typed in n deriv, just like the syntax on the 84, but it comes up as central diff, that's the central difference quotient or symmetric difference quotient. That you very cool. All right, I'll okay. uh, quit the share there. And we're probably well, Curtis, I think we've looked at a lot of cool things. Are there any questions outstanding in the chat? Um, I haven't seen anything still outstanding. Okay. Uh, Stephen Beck said that that was a pretty cool problem, very tricky. Uh, that idea that you, you know, you it appeared that there was uh, a derivative. Uh, uh, no derivative, derivative but, yeah. but there is in fact uh, a derivative there. So that was a really nice problem. Uh, some cool stuff. Active chat tonight. Really enjoyed uh, chatting with all of you out there in, in the uh, in the chat. 
Um, Steve, uh, Tom, thanks again so much for your expertise and for sharing these problems. And we'll uh, look forward to, to another uh, round here in a couple of weeks. Good. We will uh, go ahead and get those problems posted on the, uh, on the next uh, session uh, very quickly. I'll make sure that those get posted up there uh, on, uh, by tomorrow. I'll get them posted up there tomorrow so that uh, teachers can go out and, and check those out. Otherwise, um, watch for our next session. I believe we're, uh, we're up again, what, October 17th. Is that correct? I think that's right. I think actually October 20th. Oh, is it October 20th? Yeah, that's right. special we have a Thursday, Thursday night. That's right. We have a special Thursday night edition of, of uh, Monday Night Calculus coming next, uh, next, uh, next time. So it'll be uh, Thursday night, October 20th for Monday Night Calculus, our next session. All right. We'll look forward to uh, catching everyone uh, on October 20th. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks. Bye-bye, everyone.